So Denise, thank you again so much for coming on to our podcast. So for anyone who's, I guess, not from ICO, um, can you tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Denise Alexopoulos. I'm an ICO grad, as well as all of you. And then I did a pediatric and infant vision residency at SUNY College of Optometry, where I spent half my time at the SUNY clinic and half my time at a hospital there. And then I've been at clinical faculty at ICO ever since. So most of my time is spent in the clinic, but I also do a lab for first years and I'm working on actually, um, I'm going to be teaching the PEDS course to the third years this summer. So that's been a project I've been undertaking. And yeah, that's me as far as optometry. Otherwise, I'm a big Harry Potter nerd. I love bar fitness, all types of other things. <laughs> nice. It's so funny that you say that. Actually, my husband just called me to tell me he just bought the first Harry Potter book on Audible. Oh, <laughs> the best. He was oh so my excited. Gosh, the audiobooks are the best. <laughs> yeah. We're in so late. I know. <laughs> no, we, no, we're big Harry Potter fans, but he was oh. excited that he could listen to it on his drive. Oh, yeah. oh so yeah. he's already read the first book. Oh, yeah. No, he's we've read all the books. Everything. Oh, the okay. He just wants to hear it again. Oh, so you, yeah. okay, yeah. that's a true fan then. Yeah. It is. yeah. Getting, <laughs> listening to the book, reading the book. All right. Yeah. Fair yeah. enough. <laughs> um, so Denise, just to get things started, uh, mm -hmm. case history is an important part of every exam in order to understand the patient as a whole. So in order to understand our special needs pediatric patients better, what are some necessary questions to include about their history and visual demands? Absolutely. Great question. So that is my biggest pet peeve is when we have a patient with special needs and the student comes out and they're like, yeah, they have no complaints. I was like, well, of course they have no complaints. Let's ask some <laughs> more questions. So yes, we all absolutely have to ask about, I start all the way with birth and then we go through to where the patient is visually and developmentally now. So we have to ask about pregnancy. Were there any issues with drug use in utero or any trauma in utero? And then we ask about perinatal history. History. So the birth itself and the delivery, were there any complications there? Because a lot of our, our conditions like CP, cerebral palsy, for example, that often comes from some type of hypoxic event that happens while the child is being born. So, and that explains a lot of the ocular findings that we see later, such as optic nerve pallor, things like that. So we have to ask about prenatal, perinatal, and then postnatal history. So was there any prematurity? Was there any oxygen that had to be given, supplemental oxygen that has had to be given after the child was born? And then after that, we move into development. So instead of asking the parent, sometimes you can ask a general question of, have they met all their developmental milestones? But some parents might not know what that means necessarily. So I often find the easiest way to find out is by asking what their therapies is the child enrolled in? And I ask specifically, is there speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, or behavioral therapy? And then by finding out all of those things, when a parent says, yeah, they're in speech therapy three times a week, then that's an easy transition for you as the doc to say, okay, so is there a speech delay? What are we working on in speech therapy? And then it's an easier way rather than asking in front of the kid, does your child have any delays, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's typically my favorite way to transition into asking some of those history questions. And then the last important question is asking about their school setting. So what type of classroom are they in? How many children are in the classroom? And do they get pulled out for any special subjects like reading or some of their therapies might happen during school? So the parent might tell you, yeah, they get pulled out for speech therapy once a week or OT twice a week or whatever it may be. Okay. Yeah, nice. That's pretty thorough. Yeah. Yeah, I think, but if you think checklist. about it chronologically, it makes sense. And I know it yeah. sounds like it could take a lot of time, but a lot of that could happen on a, a pre-screening kind of questionnaire. Mm -hmm. If you have a questionnaire in your office, obviously at ICO, we don't have that. So we're just kind of asking those verbally, but there we also kind of have the luxury of time. So we're able to ask all of those things, but yeah, just kind of taking it chronologically. And I will admit when I'm doing direct care, I might not ask every single one of those questions. You kind of mm -hmm. look at the child in front of you and figure <laughs> out what is most pertinent pertinent to ask, but I think it's just finding a way to ask those questions sensitively is what's the most important. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it just reminds everyone that, you know, the person, um, you want to take care of their vision as them as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. Because then when you're asking all these questions, now you start to realize the person is a person and mm -hmm. not just a set of eyes. So it's like, it's yeah. always a good reminder that they're going through other things in life too. 
Yeah. And then even asking about hobbies too. Sometimes mm -hmm. you might have kids who like to knit or do things that you never would have imagined. And so that's a good way to get to know them and talk to them more about their everyday life and build a little bit of rapport. And then also to get a sense of visually what exactly they need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Denise, in a private care setting like us right now working in, what are some ways we can modify or other ODs can modify their exam rooms to be more appropriate for um, kids with disabilities? Yeah, that's a great question too. I mean, I think that it's hard to modify an exam room, right? You have mm -hmm. your exam room set up as it is. So I think it's easiest to actually modify yourself and make yourself as portable as you can be. So making mm -hmm. sure that you have equipment that's not tethered to a wall or the base of your phoropter, because then if the child's in a wheelchair, you don't have to stress about getting them out of the wheelchair. You can do mm -hmm. all of your testing, your RET, your direct ophthalmoscopy, your cover test, your near VAs mm -hmm. in while they're sitting in the wheelchair or if a child's very anxious and they only you know they won't even go near the exam chair they want to sit on mom's lap in the parent or guest chair that you have on the side of the room you can have them stay there and then you just move yourself over so a lot of peds is just i love wearing scrubs is my favorite thing because I can sit on the floor and not feel bad about it. I can, yeah. you know, you can just be everywhere and get down on the kid's level and, and be right in front of them. So I think that's a modification. And then otherwise, something I think that's helpful is as something as simple as getting like decals that you can put on the wall that maybe have some fun shape that you can have the kid look at so that if you needed a target for RET or cover test or something, you could at least have something that you could direct their attention to. Yeah. Do you wear a white coat when you're dealing with the kids? No, I mean, now we switched to scrubs. No one's wearing mm -hmm. a white coat anyway in the clinic, but even mm -hmm. before I never did. And I had a few situations with students where we had a patient with special needs. Patients with autism tend to be really afraid of white coats. Yeah. And so the student kind of came out and said, I can't get anything. The child is screaming. I can't figure out what's going on. And so I said, okay, take yeah. off your white coat. Let's go in. And we both went in without coats. And the kid was a totally different child after that. Yeah. So it's something very triggering because people in white coats give them shots and strap yeah. them down to do their dental exams and all of these mm -hmm. things so they just get a little bit triggered so I always take it off for peds. I do think that the scrubs though are great because oh, you yeah. can sit on the floor like mm -hmm. I've sat on the floor so many times with kids now that I'm mm -hmm. like this is wonderful yeah <laughs> yeah it's so because then it just feels like you're playing with them or at least you're you're able to get down on their level and no one's you know, you're not wearing heels or skirts or anything that's uncomfortable. It's just, it's so much easier to just get in and do the work. Yeah. Um, what are particular visual or ocular disorders that are common in children with disabilities? Um, let's see. So let's talk through, I will actually, we don't even have to talk through the specific disabilities because so many of them have similar findings. Mm -hmm. I was actually just talking to some of my fourth years the other night and we went through Down syndrome, autism, cerebral palsy, and ADD. And every single slide where I got to ocular disabilities, every single one had strabismus, amblyopia, refractive error. So generally mm -hmm. when you're examining patients with special needs, you definitely want to look for those three things. So, and also anisomotropia, which could be caused causing um, refractive amblyopia. So uh, any strab, amblyopia, refractive errors, a lot of times hyperopia is very common in most of these conditions, but also in Down syndrome specifically, we're looking at a lot of astigmatism and oblique astigmatism. So we wanna look at those things. Down syndrome and cerebral palsy can also have nystagmus, so you want to look for that. And then in your more high-functioning kids where you're able to test these things, then sometimes accommodative disorders and convergence disorders as well, as well as oculomotor abnormalities. So anything of that nature you want to look for if they're high-functioning enough that you can test it. Yeah. And then even with, um, aside from the common diagnoses that they can have, you know, behavioral patterns can say a lot about the patient's visual system even before the exam begins. So what common behavioral patterns or observations should ODs be more aware of when assessing the pediatric patient with disabilities that may indicate that they have poor visual function? 
That's really an important thing to look for, definitely. And that can that can take care of so much of your case history if you, mm-hmm. you just do a gross observation of the patient. And that's not just kids with special needs, that's any child, right? You can yeah. kind of tell what's going on if you just take a gross look and look at the, the forest and not just the trees. I think a big one is eye contact. So young children, babies especially, should be interested in human faces. So if you have a baby that's just kind of not looking at you or the parent or any face, that's in the room that's one thing to that's kind of a red flag that might alert you that vision is not quite fully developed maybe not if they're a one month old but if they're a six month old when we're typically seeing them they should be looking at some type of human face that they can interact with and then if you're presenting them with colorful stimuli and they're not looking at that either by six months we have most of our accommodative ability is there and so even if you present something up close if you give them a target or a sticker they should at least be interested and try to reach for it and grab for it so if you are presenting them with either your own face or any type of colored target and there's no sense of wanting to reach for it or look at it those are things that are typically a little bit concerned Sometimes I feel like I've noticed during my residency, kids mm-hmm. that'll have accommodative disorders or really high hyperopia that's never been diagnosed before will also have that short attention span, right? Mm-hmm. So they'll be kind of running around the room and you, you realize with some of these kids, once you give them their glasses prescription, parents will notice that their behavior has changed significantly. Yeah. Um, so I know I personally tend to pay a little close attention to that. When I see a child who really, really can't sit still, they just kind of bump into the door and bump into the wall a little. Um, Because even before you start the exam, I think you can always make this assumption that, okay, they either don't have a good accommodative system or they just don't have good vision in general because they Mm -hmm. can't even focus on any target anywhere. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I think that's a great addition that you made because if you have a child and the parents are telling you there's no known history of an attention deficit disorder, but you see the kid flying around the room, yeah. then yeah, maybe that's because they're unable to focus on whatever it is that's in front of them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times when we prescribe glasses in a younger age group like that, mm-hmm. a great thing to tell the parents is, hey, pay attention. And when you come back at the follow up, I want to know have there been any behavioral changes? Have you noticed yeah. any changes in how they interact with others or? how they play with toys or how they just walk around a room. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, kind of going back to what you were talking about earlier. So if you have an infant that's six months old and it's not like paying attention to your face or any visual stimulus, like what do you do next? Like what's the next plan? Yeah, I think the next plan is trying to measure their vision in some type of way. So seeing if can they fix and follow a transilluminator, an infant should do that, especially if you turn the lights down in the room, an infant should want to follow the one thing that is stimulating Mm -hmm. in the room, which would be the transilluminator. So you could do that. You want to do a retinoscopy and see is there some extremely high refractive error that you can put in a trial frame and see if that behavior changes. Otherwise, if you know that the child has a history of let's say cerebral palsy, where we know that sometimes there can be cortical visual impairment, you might be thinking that there's some cortical visual impairment there if they're not having any reaction. Also, if you, I know a lot of people don't have these, but if you have an OKN drum, that's a great thing to pull out in those Mm -hmm. scenarios where the transilluminator or other bright, exciting stimuli are not really causing them to have any visual attention. Mm -hmm. Then if it's cortical visual impairment, the ocular health will look perfect. But if it's CP, sometimes they can have optic atrophy and that can be the cause of the reduced vision. So trying to kind of get to the bottom of why this child is not attending to things visually. Um, So Denise, you may have just answered half of this question. I'm just going to ask next, (laughs) but um, (laughs) it can be pretty nerve wracking to have an infant under the age of two come in for an eye exam for an OD who's used to seeing much older patients. But it may help to have a checklist when assessing um, the most important aspects of uh, vision for that child. So what would be on your checklist for an infant eye exam? I know you just mentioned a few, but 
just no, no, story. this is, I'm so glad you asked this question because anytime I talk to students and residents about doing infant eye exams, I always do talk about a checklist. And sometimes mm -hmm. a checklist can sound kind of elementary, but I yeah. think what's scary to people about infant and, and toddler eye exams is not just that you have to get this child to pay attention and that you're intimidated by maybe the parents or whatever, but it's that often the way people approach an infant eye exam is they think, okay, what are the normal things that I do during an adult eye exam? okay, how am I going to water those down and do them on a child? But really, you kind of want to go the opposite way. So you want to start with, I have this infant in my chair, and what's the important information I need from them? So don't think of them as a watered down adult. Think of them as just the infant that's in front of you, and what do you need? So anytime I talk about this with people, I, I break it down into what are the big four questions that we need to answer. So I don't necessarily have a checklist of exam techniques, but I have a, a checklist of questions that I need answered during the exam. So the first one is, can the child see and can they see equally between the two eyes? So we did just kind of talk about that a little bit, but that's, you know, whether you're doing a teller visual acuity or Cardiff cards or even just fix and follow, you need to get a sense of whether binocularly the child is attending to a visual stimulus and seeing. And then after you get binocular data, then you need to try for something monocular. And on most of my infant exams, I can do teller binocularly and then they're tired. So by then we have to figure out how to monocularly at least assess that the vision is equal. So by then I'm usually doing a fix and follow OD and OS. So with each eye occluded, and then if they can't even do that, then the last thing that you can check for is resistance to occlusion. So occlude the left eye, occlude the right eye, and then see, is there any difference in the child's reaction when you do those two things? Mm -hmm. If the child freaks out when you occlude the right eye, but acts completely unfazed when you occlude the left eye, then that's a hint that one eye is seeing much more clearly than the other and mm -hmm. you need to delve more into that and so that's kind of step one so step one is is the child seeing and is they are they seeing equally between the two eyes Number two is, are the eyes aligned? So generally you're doing a Hirschberg or some type of cover test if you can get them to focus on the stimulus. Number three is, is there amblyopia or an amblyogenic risk factor? So that is mainly your RET and your cover test. Those two things are gonna tell you whether there's some large amblyogenic refractive error or strabismus that you are gonna need to treat or at least monitor if they're very little. And then the last one is, are the eyes healthy? So that's just mainly your BIO um, and just making sure that slit lamp and all of that is good. And in your infants, the biggest thing that I tend to look at is the lens. You really want to make sure that we're not missing any congenital cataracts there. So number one is, can the child see? Number two, is there a strabismus? Number three, is there amblyopia? Number four, is ocular health unremarkable? And once you answer those four questions, then you're done. So that made it, it sound way, so easy. Yeah, way easier. <laughs> yes, it's my favorite yeah. thing. <laughs> but you know, you know what? That's true though, because every time I have an infant, like I've seen, um, I've seen more infants now, even compared to my residency. But now I'm seeing so many like four month olds and six month olds, and mm -hmm. I freak out every time they come in, yeah. and then I realize. They can't even talk. Why am I scared? Yes. I just have to stare at <laughs> their eyes and make exactly. sure that they can see me. Yes. It's you know? your easiest exam. I will never, I will go yeah. to my grave saying that your infant is your easiest exam. And so is your super special needs child. Because when you yeah. are, have to do everything objectively, it's the, it's, that's the easiest for you because you know how to yeah. do all those things and you don't have to rely on them for everything. So I will yeah. say that those, that big four is more for infants. Obviously, as we get into more school age kids, mm -hmm. we need to assess by binocularity, accommodation, all those things, because yeah. their visual needs are so different. But for infants, it can really be broken down into that. Yeah. I wanted to um, add just on when you were mentioning retinoscopy, um, you know, we're all aware that children sometimes can have short attention spans and they can get distracted very easily. So do you have any tips on how to maintain their focus during the exam, like especially retinoscopy? Um, for us doctors who don't have videos or animations, um, you know, that play in the background. 
So yeah, that's really a great question. I remember when I did my residency at SUNY, we had movies, but at the hospital, yeah. all we had was a projector screen and it was miserable because you <laughs> had to find ways to keep them engaged without a movie, which is really hard, especially yeah. now when kids are looking at screens like that from when they're born, they're just not, they're not going to be excited to look at a chart of pictures. Yeah. That being said, we did have at the hospital, we had a uh, Allen acuity chart that we could use at distance. So I would put up probably a 2100 or 2200 Allen chart that had four symbols on it. And there would be maybe a duck and an umbrella and a phone and something else. And then I just would ask questions about all of those things. What do you see? How many legs does the duck have? What does the umbrella look like? And you just have to keep asking questions about whatever it is that they're looking at. Also a cheat, if you don't have movies in your exam, room parents usually have their phone with them so have them pull up their favorite youtube video and stand 10 feet away from you mm -hmm. and i promise you the kid will look right at it although sometimes that can backfire because the kid wants to reach for the yeah. phone and then yeah. you lose them so <laughs> if that's one's yeah. hit or miss but if you're desperate and you need it that's a great target for bio though because even if the kid yeah. is reaching for it at least they're looking in the direction you need them to look mm -hmm. yeah I actually get my scribe to hold the parent's cell phone and mm -hmm. behind me, like behind cool. my head, like yep. either side. Yeah. But not everyone has a scribe, but yeah, um, it's great. Thanks Wait, for what? rubbing it in. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know I get the siblings involved. I'll get like the brother yeah. and sister to kind of stand 10 feet away. I'm like, okay, someone start dancing. <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you I get the parents involved. Yeah. I will also say too, I know, I remember when I was a student, I would watch Dr. Katouf do ret on these babies or these toddlers oh, yeah. and they were never looking at distance. And I remember asking her like, aren't you with aren't you supposed to be doing Mohindra if they're yeah. looking there and she's like no what who cares if I'm yeah. a half diopter off it's not that big a deal especially if the child is cycloplege so I don't want to be too blase about it but if yeah. you're god forbid the kid just will not focus on something worst yeah. case yeah. you just have them look at your light and then you you mm -hmm. adjust your working distance to kind of do more of a Mohindra from there so you can always adjust it and especially in our infants we're just looking for a gross range mm -hmm. of our ret so if I I scope 150, but it's actually two. That's not really significant. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Denise, can you share, um, can you share vision developmental milestones for infants that eye care professionals need to keep in mind when examining these patients? Yeah, I would say the biggest thing that I get questions about and the biggest thing that's important to know is when does emetropization happen as far as visual development goes, because that's really one of the main things that's guiding your refracting, your, your prescribing decisions in these kids is, is this refractive error going to emetropize out? Is it something I need to worry about right now? So if we remember, most of emetropization happens in infants between 12 and 17 months. So you can expect some changes to happen there with regard to myopia, hyperopia, and astigmatism. And then hyperopia continues to emetropize until around two, although we know with sphere, you know, hyperopia, myopia, we can see changes for a long time, but the biggest changes happen until about two years old. And then astigmatism can, can emetropize even up to four years old. So that one, we have a little bit of extra wiggle room there. But I would say those are the biggest kind of milestones that I think about as far as my exam because again, that guides your prescribing decisions the most. What's the, I know it's kind of off topic, but what's the average you uh, prescribe for? Like, what are your standards for like hyperopia? Like what age would you prescribe for a certain number? Like, I know yeah. that's like one thing. It's we so all hard. Such a broad so question. Hard. I know, yeah. it's hard. Well, the biggest thing is to think about. So I think rather than giving you specific numbers and ages mm -hmm. and cutoffs, I will guide you to, there's an article that's my favorite article in all of optometry. And it's called um, something about prescribe, the art of prescribing how to something without making a spectacle of yourself. I'll send it to you yeah. guys. But it's yeah. a great article. And what they do is they, they break it down into three questions that you have to ask yourself when you're looking at a refractive error and deciding whether to prescribe for the child. So the first one is, is this refractive error going to emetropize? So is it gonna go away? The second one is, will not prescribing for this child cause a visual detriment? Essentially, are we gonna be causing amblyopia or mm -hmm. lack of 
hospital development if we don't prescribe? And then the third one is, if we do prescribe, can we improve the visual development and the visual function? And if you can break it down into those three questions and your answers lead you to prescribing versus monitoring, then you can kind of go either way with it. Um, I could talk for hours on, you know, for a two-year-old, if you see this, do this. For a three-year-old, if you see this, do this, right? And it's so dependent on, is there esotropia? What's the child's vision like and their visual yeah. behavior and all of those? So I don't mean to dismiss your question, but I think if you break it down into those three things, it, yeah. it makes it a lot easier. And then I have people text me all the time with, okay, here's my RET, here's the vision, what would you give? And that's my whole life is answering those. Yeah. So you can always send those <laughs> oh. over to me or to Emirate. No, or be careful, Denise. Have. Don't don't let yeah. yourself look <laughs> like that. You're gonna no, get no. texts from I these four it. four of us. No, I love it because you're like, I what put it. Yeah. My plan for the course this summer is to make it a lot more case-based. So I love when I get texts because I just put the screenshots in a PowerPoint and oh. then we kind of just talk. Oh, through. Yeah, I take oh, up cool. people's name, but I just <laughs> put the screenshot right in a PowerPoint. And then I say like, okay, we're going to, this is what my thought process was. This is what we ended up prescribing. So yeah. I love getting questions because it's, you know, material that I can use. Yeah. I think that was like the biggest lesson I learned in residency was when to prescribe for hyperopia. So mm-hmm. I will put a shameless plug right in here because I wrote a um, how to prescribe for hyperopia article on um, eyes on eye care. They, they changed their brand from covalent careers. Um, mm-hmm. So very similar to what you mentioned, I think uh, where I personally started to lean more towards prescribing for, for hyperopia was also amblyo amblyogenic risk factors, of course, um, always look at their, you know, their BV and their accommodative system, right? So if they have accommodative insufficiency, if they have an esotropia, if they're getting asthenopia, headaches, you know, double vision, all of this, that always leans you more towards the reason for, for prescribing mm-hmm. versus not prescribing. Like I've, I've seen a teenager with, you know, plus four in each eye and he's 2020 or 2025 uncorrected. And he's like, no, I'm good. (laughs) I don't have headaches. I don't have anything. And I'm like, you know what? We don't need to give you glasses this year then. So it's, or it's, it's I can all... give them to you and you'll come back every year and tell me that you don't wear That's, them. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Let's monitor. And, and, you know, I always tell them if you get headaches, if you get eye strain, come on back, we'll give you glasses. If you're fine, you're fine. I don't need to give you this plus four prescription when you're asymptomatic or, you know, for kids, if you don't have those risk factors of developing diplopia or strabismus and all this. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's tough prescribing for hyperopia. It's always a it's kind of sometimes a guessing game, but you can mm-hmm. never go wrong prescribing it though. I, I feel agree. like you can never go wrong prescribing it. Maybe you just gave them useless glasses, but it, yeah, you gave them something. It won't harm them. Yeah. Well, and I think the biggest mistake people make is they push too much of the plus yeah. and then they blur them a distance and then the kid yeah. is miserable and they'll never wear them. So you're plus four, 14 year old. If you gave him plus two at near, he might be okay with that, but yeah. he's not going to ever wear his plus four. So you yeah. kind of have to come up with compromises for patients mm-hmm. like that. And that's mm-hmm. the beauty of teenagers and older patients is that you're there. They have the agency to be able to tell you, yeah, I'm having symptoms. No, I'm not. Mm-hmm. With a younger child, we don't really give them those same liberties we have to decide yeah. for them yeah mm-hmm. that was a very off tangent question that's one of the biggest questions people have so it I is it's great to touch on yeah. that so for children that come in with eye injuries what are the signs and symptoms that we should be looking out for in children that may experience trauma and or physical abuse at home that's a tricky one. And luckily, it's not one that we have to address too often. I think this is my now fifth year doing peds eye care. And I've only had to kind of have this conversation about two times in that entire time. So that's a blessing is that it's not something that we encounter super frequently. That being said, it's if you see a child with an eye injury, and something in your gut is telling you, you maybe need to ask some additional questions. You might not feel comfortable asking those to the parent, but you can just ask what happened? How did this happen? And then you as the provider kind of subtly do a quick glance, you know, is the, does the child have any other bumps and bruises that you feel are suspicious? Does the child show any psychological signs that maybe they are unwell or something is going on? Although I will say the one child that I ended up reporting that was uh, one of the two I reported actually ended up getting removed from the home because there was additional proof that he was being abused. And he was the most happy-go-lucky, cheerful little kid you would never would have known 
down. So that's not always a marker, but sometimes it can be. And then if there's anything in your gut that's telling you that this is something that you need to report, we are mandated reporters. So I remember earlier when I was a, a new grad, I was very nervous about making that phone call because I'm like, what if I'm wrong? And they're just going to snatch this kid away from their parents and it's my fault. But really what happens when you call is you just explain very objectively to the person on the phone what happened. They write it down. And then based on their experience, if they think it warrants additional investigation, then they will go to the house. They'll make a house call. They'll ask some more questions. They'll try and figure out what's going on. And then the government eventually is the judge of whether that child needs to be removed or not. So don't be afraid to make the call just because you're afraid that they're going to go take the kid away right away. That's not what happens. Mm -hmm. The one time I called, they were very blunt with me and said, you know what, this doesn't really sound like anything. We'll start a file and we'll write it down. And then if we get any other reports about this family, we'll consider making a house call. But right now, it's not something we need to act on. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other ones was a lot more obvious. And that was the one that ended up being removed from the home. So that's my biggest advice is if something feels off, you are a mandated reporter. And that's not just for peds, that's for geriatrics, that's for any patient with special needs of any age who might not have their own power of attorney. So you need to kind of be the advocate for those patients if you feel like something is going on and just do the right thing. And then as far as documentation for those, just be, I would say, be very objective in your chart. So you would just say, child came in, this is what we observed, phone call was made, this is the case report, and then you leave it at that um, and they'll follow up with you if needed. Actually, I do you have a further question about that? Are there any specific I um, signs that we should be looking for, like bilateral subconjemes or something where that kind of would raise a red flag or is it kind of any just asking more questions? I would say any type of retinal heme, whether it's bilateral okay. or unilateral in a child that doesn't have a history of something systemic. So right. if they just have hemes out of nowhere and they also have a bruised eye and a subconch heme, you know, there's, there are all types of signs that you can look for in the eye. But I would say any sign of trauma that you could see in an adult, we would look for that same thing. Okay. So Denise, as our last question here, so as eye care professionals, we always want to come off professional and knowledgeable to the guardians of these child patients. And since some of us do not have children of our own, there are times when the guardians may ask, do you have kids? So, and second guess our treatment and management recommendations. So in your opinion, how can eye care professionals build trust with the guardians that question our experience with children? But that's something that I worried about a lot early on in my career because I am young and I don't have kids and I often wondered what are these people going to think of me? I'm mm -hmm. making all these recommendations to them and I don't even have kids of my own. So I think the first one is talking to people in your circle who do have kids and especially mm -hmm. people who have children who need to wear glasses or have any type of visual problems. I know there are a few docs at ICO that said, oh man, I always used to judge parents who didn't have their kids wear their glasses. And then when my kid was a plus two and I was trying to get him to wear his glasses, it was a nightmare. So mm -hmm. they became a lot more empathetic and understanding. Mm -hmm. So talk to people about their experiences and see how you can incorporate that into your education. And then I found that in my career, the first thing is people will not typically ask you that question of, well, do you have kids? What do you know? Those type of questions often come from a place of defensiveness. Mm -hmm. And the only reason you would make somebody defensive is if you came off in any way judgmental of their parenting style, or if you came off frustrated with their child. So mm -hmm. I have found if you come off that you are patient and loving and compassionate to their kid, people will generally be a lot warmer to you because that you've already proven to them that you have their child's best interest at heart and that you really care about the patient and anything you're recommending is just because you want them to succeed visually or academically or whatever it is. So I would say that's the first one is just building rapport. Even when that kid is being awful, you can put your foot down in a situation where you need to, but always from a place of compassion and not from a place of judgment. And then always coming at situations with empathy, again, rather than judgment. So leading with empathy. And what that means is when you're 
let's say your kid who's an amblyo, if the parents come back and they haven't worn the glasses at all, instead of right away jumping to, well, you really need to wear the glasses, otherwise the vision's not gonna get better, take a step back and ask, okay, what is the barrier to us wearing the glasses? What's going on? How can I help you overcome that? And really come at it with a place of understanding and coming up with solutions as much as you can, rather than judging someone's parent style. And I think that that's, those are the biggest thing. You're never gonna know what it's like to have kids until you have them. And you're never gonna know what it's like to have a kid with special needs until you have one. And so if if we're able to try and empathize with people, put ourselves in their shoes and really just be compassionate towards their situation rather than being more paternalistic and judgmental as doctors, I don't think we'll ever put a parent in a situation where they say, well, you don't even have kids, so you don't know what you're talking about. I feel like I get that question from parents of, do you have kids when they have their three kids or four kids in the exam room and they're all running around and I'm just sitting there and they're trying to get everyone under control and they're like, oh gosh, do you have kids? And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. But (laughs) yeah, I was like, I don't know. I don't know how I can help you. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, that's most time I get that question. (laughs) I was going to ask you if you've been asked that in a tone of, well, do you have kids? How do you know what you're talking about? Like, has that happened Mm -hmm. to you guys personally? I haven't had it. Um, A 50 year old man tell me that the the clock is ticking, basically. (laughs) (laughs) But I have yeah, I haven't had the other. I was like, okay. I'm so upset. That's a whole oh, other conversation, right? That there. really is. Yeah. yeah. You'll have to have me on again. And we'll talk about that for an hour and a half. Well, everything you said today, Denise, yeah. was amazing. I think this this conversation is gonna be really helpful for a lot of listeners who might get really nervous with peds, especially infants coming in. Um, mm-hmm. and any time that we have a patient with special needs, I think every checklist and every question that you kind of reviewed today is definitely going to stick with us now. And we're going to mm-hmm. approach these patients a little differently now, just to make sure we can improve on our service to them. So thank you again so much for sharing all that information. Absolutely. Yeah. I love talking about this stuff. I had such a good time.